You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg. Uh, Today, we have an author on who I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. I'm sure a number of you have read uh, some of his books. Perhaps you've read the book we're talking about today, Flames Beyond Gettysburg, the Confederate Expedition to the Susquehanna River, June 1863. And his name is Scott Mingus. Hey, Scott, how are you? Hey, good, thanks. Um, welcome to the show. Appreciate it. Thanks. I, I, I know uh, we were talking before that I, I got up to you at a book sign about two years ago mm-hmm. and I got in your card and uh, I never followed through until uh, recently. Um, but uh, I always believe that there's a right time for things, sure. you know, and I felt uh, that it was too soon back then because I just started the show and I was like, yeah, certain people I think need to wait until the audience gets bigger. So, okay. so here we are. Uh, thank you. I appreciate being on. Sure. Um, give the uh, audience a little bit of a background. Uh, would you consider yourself a historian or what is your, how do you see yourself? What did you do oh, yeah, in life? Like, yeah, in life. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm actually a scientist, so I spent, okay. my, spent 40 years in the global pulp and paper industry as a global technology leader. Uh, finished my career as the global director of new product development for a paper company based in adjoining York County, Pennsylvania, about 20 miles east of here. Okay. And uh, do, you, do you live in York City or near York City? I or live, you... uh, yeah, I live uh, north of York uh, in Manchester Township. So okay. So for me to drive to Gettysburg, it's a, it's an easy drive. But yeah. you ask about a historian. Uh, my, my two sons are the historians. They both have master's or PhDs in history and undergrads in history as well. I'm just the mere scientist that writes books. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And did you, uh, where did you get the interest in uh, Civil War history? History. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, actually, it started very young. My dad was a World War II veteran, actually landed on Normandy on D-Day Plus oh, wow. One okay. on June 7th, 18, uh, 1944. Uh, but our family's always really been big in history. So from the time I grew up, I heard a lot of stories about uh, ancestors who fought in the war. My mom was 13 when her great-grandfather died. He was the last Civil War veteran left in East Central Ohio. He'd hmm. been a 15-year-old drummer for the 51st Ohio Volunteers and then was a rifleman the last two years of the war, uh, serving in Franklin and uh, Nashville. So I grew up with a lot of Civil War history in our family. Nice. And I was about uh, 10, I grew up 10 miles away from the boyhood home of Fighting Phil Sheridan, uh, the Union Cavalry General, who has uh-huh. an equestrian statue on the pretty much my backyard if you will right okay so you grow up seeing that and oh yeah it's kind of hmm, what's this exactly yeah uh and so moving to york um i guess what 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 is it that uh, made you interested enough to want to write a book about this oh uh, great question uh moving to york i've always been a civil war nut i did a lot of research on the civil war when i lived in northeastern ohio Moved here in 2001, and my oldest son wrote his master's thesis in history on the burning of the Wrightsville Bridge. Hmm. Uh, And I took a look at that and thought, you know, there's far more than just a bridge burning here. This is an entire campaign, and nobody's ever really covered it in terms of a book, a full-length book before. Right. Uh, So this was actually the very first book book. Civil War book, at least that I've written. Uh, so I got. And you've written many since then, right? Oh yeah, I've written yeah. twenty four total books. <laughs> wow. Uh, you know, plus, plus about seven war gaming books. So I've got a. Like, oh, are you into war gaming? Yeah, very much. Like we, we got the table and yeah, everything, and you got to make war gaming. How, yeah. did, how does that work? I, I remember I had a friend who uh, did that, and uh, he tried to get me to play it, but I, I think I fell asleep in the middle. <laughs> of, like it's it's slow moving, right? And oh yeah, it's, it can be. It can be. You got to like roll dice and yeah, stuff. It can be. Yeah, it, typically you lay out model railroad type. Uh, tabletops if you will and then use specific rule sets and each figure a little miniature figure represents 30 or 50 or or however many men you want it to represent depending on the rule set and then you just refight battles using uh, miniature tactics that are similar to the actual tactics and do the do the outcomes change or is it are you refighting historically yeah, it depends what you're trying to do in a lot of cases you can make up your own scenarios and do what ifs uh, okay. for example what you know one of the ones that i like to do and i've had a lot of people do is what if uh the confederates would have attacked cemetery hill on july 1st well okay. you can refight that in miniature uh and just you know figure out what might have happened uh, and 
what you roll a dice and then whatever the number uh, is then it that tells means some sort of a result some okay. type of movement or yeah movement or combat results or morale checks for the units and whether they stay okay. put or they run away or and so that's out. how you tell who yeah, wins and who loses yeah that's it's basically chess on steroids yeah yeah okay yeah. <laughs> chess with little model houses and, exactly yeah yeah um okay so you've written some books on that sure how many books on that seven Seven books on that. Yeah. What so, is there to write about? Uh, I usually write scenarios. Uh, oh. So, uh, you know, I'll take, oh. I'll take like the Battle of Gettysburg and I'll break it down into bite sized chunks for war gamers and they can <laughs> refight Gettysburg in different actions. That's cool. Yeah. There's, there's all these. Uh, subcultures of you know people with these interests and in these are. things and it's and it's amazing it's just and and there there's so much uh material on them you know and then for me, like me like you know if i never heard of it and then all of a sudden i find there's a whole new world out there uh-huh. and all these books and oh, all yeah. this stuff that's out there for people that are into that stuff exactly that's pretty good it's nice to have a hobby right it is it's, yeah. yeah it keeps your Especially, mind busy you know living for 23 years in the snow belt between cleveland and erie, erie pennsylvania i had plenty of time to create <laughs> tabletops and paint thousands of little miniature yeah. guys and stuff because so. <laughs> right, you're trapped in the house yeah, not much else you're going to do in cleveland in the winter <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh okay so uh, York. Let's, mm-hmm. let's, we're talking today about uh, Gordon's uh, capture of York. It wasn't really a capture. They kind of just, it sounds like they just rolled over like a dog <laughs> wanting his belly scratched. <laughs> um, we'll go into a little bit of that. First of all, how does York fit into the overall campaign and Gordon, you know, sure. in his role? Yeah, let me step back just for those of our uh, viewership or listening ship that may not be familiar. York as it is today, is the largest city between Baltimore and Harrisburg. Mm-hmm. Um, so it has always been a strategically important city as a result of that because the Pennsylvania Turnpike went through there and the north-south Turnpike from Harrisburg to Baltimore uh, cross-sected the east-west Philadelphia uh, Pittsburgh um, uh, Turnpike in mm-hmm. York. Uh, so it's always been a pretty important place. In fact, during the American Revolution, it's where the Articles of Confederation were drafted right while York was the capital of the United States for nine There's months. There's a signer of the Declaration of Independence buried there, Two of them. Two Phil- of them. Yeah, Philip Livingston and James Smith are both buried in York. Okay. So York has always been, at least in, in the old days, was was pretty well known as a national entity. It was home to, the, during the Gettysburg campaign, it was the home to the largest military hospital in South Central Pennsylvania uh. with 1,600 beds. It was uh. also the home to uh, a United States Army training camp uh, at the start of the Civil War. Camp Winfield Scott. So it, you know, compared to Gettysburg, which really didn't have a lot of formal United States military facilities, York did Mm -hmm. uh, with the 1600 bed hospital and again, this 5,000 man training base. So it was always on the Confederates radar that York was at least an important potential military target wealthy city, lots of supplies, uh, several factories in the area, uh, and a a big railroad and network that connected to a canal and also, of course, had the turnpike. So Mm -hmm. the city figured prominently in a lot of Confederate plans. So in mid-June 1863, when uh, Richard Yule brought the Second Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia into Pennsylvania, he certainly had York on his mind. Uh, on June 22nd, he met with one of his subordinates, Major General Jubal Early, and ordered Early to move east through Gettysburg, not far from where we're, we're sitting right now, mm-hmm. uh, and head to York. Uh, and his job was to capture the city of York, lay it under tribute, take as much money as he could out of York, and then move beyond that to the other strategically important reason why York figured in, in the uh, Confederate thinking was the world's longest covered bridge. Um, now, at the time of the Gettysburg campaign, to cross the Susquehanna River south of Harrisburg, you only had one option, uh, and that was the bridge at mm. Wrightsville. Uh, there was other bridges that had existed at one point. They were gone. Uh, all the ferry services were out of commission deliberately, and because it had been raining so much during the Gettysburg campaign at that to that point, the Fords were underwater. So that left you one option. If you're going to take Harrisburg, you had to do a frontal assault on the two bridges at Harrisburg or try a side assault through York and take this world's longest covered bridge a mile and a quarter long Mm. between Wrightsville in in York County and Columbia 
in western Lancaster County. Okay. So, Richard, you'll order Jill Worley again to march through Gettysburg, uh, march to York, and his original uh, orders were to burn the bridge at Wrightsville to, to prevent Union reinforcements from Philadelphia from crossing the river and moving into this region, impeding Lee's progress uh, in South Central Pennsylvania. So uh, they, uh, you know, people know on the 26th uh, of June, um, Gordon's Brigade comes into Gettysburg mm -hmm. and uh, they have a little bit of a party and get along great with everybody and uh, everybody's happy. And then they move on uh, and they move on. When did they get to York? Uh, yeah, the uh, Confederates are going to leave Gettysburg early in the morning of Saturday, June 27th. Mm -hmm. They will reach Western York County that evening. Uh, they will physically move on to York on the 28th. But what happens on the afternoon of the 27th is th probably the most controversial event in York's military history. <laughs> and that's the fact that uh, a young businessman in York by the name of Arthur Farquhar, uh, yeah. early 20s, uh, Quaker, businessman who owned a farm implement business uh, gets impatient at the city council doing nothing and just dithering uh, during their meeting. So on his own, he jumps in a carriage, rides west down today's U.S. Route 30 into Adams County, uh, comes to Abbottstown and meets with Confederate General John Gordon mm -hmm. and basically tells him that, you know, if you're coming to York, uh, I want you to, you know, don't harm our city and don't harm my business and don't harm the women and children. Well, it's a stunt that Farker had pulled once before in the Maryland campaign in 1862. He had actually ridden to Maryland and it was looking for Fitzhugh Lee uh, and ended up meeting with Lee and, uh, you know, basically told the same thing. If you come to New York, don't burn my town down. So he had plenty of experience in trying to negotiate <laughs> with Confederate generals. So he rides out on Saturday, June 27th, uh, and Gordon meets with him at Abbottstown and, in effect, tells him, sure, I won't harm your town. I'm not going to harm anything. But I think my commander is going to want some tribute from your town in exchange for this wonderful, magnanimous, you know, <laughs> gestures that we're making. So Farker rides back uh, to downtown York. Uh, gallops into the square with his carriage and leaps out, tells city council, hey, look what I just negotiated for you. Problem is, he's not a member of council. He's got no authority. He's a young Quaker businessman. Yeah. And the mayor's like, what the heck did you just do? <laughs> uh, so the, now the, the chief Burgess, or mayor to use today's term, uh, a couple members of the city council, a retired U.S. Army colonel, they all jump back in this guy's carriage, and he goes out to find John Gordon a second time, uh, this time with the brass from the city of York in his carriage. Okay. And this time, they meet with John Gordon. They formally surrender York to the Confederate Army uh, with the... Uh, uh, Condition. Condition, yes, thanks. <laughs> With the condition that, again, no harm happened to York, that uh, you know everything's going to be fine. Well, Gordon throws a couple little twists of his own in, basically telling this you know Quaker businessman that, oh, by the way, I know you've got a U.S. Army base in York, and I know you've got a U.S. Army hospital. If there's any Yankees that try to resist us, we're going to hang you tomorrow on the town square. <laughs> no How's that sound? Yeah. Uh, so obviously Farker's not terribly <laughs> thrilled by that, that <laughs> prospect, uh, and it kind of allows the Chief Burgess to take over the meeting and formally surrender York. Why that's so controversial, Matt, is the fact that uh, this is the only town in Pennsylvania where the Chief Burgess rides 10 miles out of town to formally negotiate with the Confederates. Uh, before the Confederates before even the Confederates get there. Even came to town. Yeah. Um, I mean, at least our Burgess had the nerve to run away. Yeah, I mean, yeah. as, as did in York County in Hanover. You know, Hanover's Burgess ran away. Yeah, you know, I stuff. mean, that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah, you're supposed to take off. But, York, but in York's case, the, their chief Burgess was a diehard copperhead, uh, mm. head of the Democratic Party in York County, and was quite the Southern sympathizer, allegedly. Yeah, so let's, okay, let's uh, get into that a little bit there before we get back to sure. what happened. So you mentioned that he's a copperhead. Um, I noticed when I was reading about when Gordon actually gets into town. It's, uh, I don't know if I've read so much about Gettysburg where there seem to be a lot of sympathizers, but it seems York has a good deal of them. And now, is it just because, it, it, did Gettysburg 
do that you know of? Did we have some sympathizers like that they seem to have had in York? Yeah, I think there were some in Adams County, but they certainly weren't prevalent. When you go okay. farther east to York County, uh, for example, Mannheim Township in southwestern York County, down by the uh, town of Hanover, voted 174 votes for John C. Breckinridge, the mm. Democrat for president in 1860. They gave two votes to Abraham Lincoln. Mm. Uh, so in the farther north you got in York County, the less copperheadish, if you will, mm -hmm. it got. But the, the borough of York itself had a lot of Confederate sympathizers. They had a few really strong Union supporters. But the, yeah, this was a pretty copperhead region. Yeah, they, it seems that they, they weren't very ashamed of uh, showing their copperheadism. Um, yeah. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Gettysburg didn't vote for Lincoln e is it either time or just the first time. Oh, I can't recall the exact numbers. But yeah, I think the first time they voted against Lincoln, I yeah. think the second time it may have been for him. But I'd have to check that. Um, yeah, Tim Smith yeah. and, and oh, yeah. local, the local experts would know that more that's, than That's I who I heard it from, but I can't remember. It's, yeah. it's a fault of my own brain. But, but York County, it's very clear. In 1860, Lincoln only carried roughly 47% of the vote. Uh, and in 1864, it was even lower. Uh, so the county got more anti-Lincoln <laughs> as a direct result of the Gettysburg campaign. Wow. Uh, okay, so so before we get... Okay, so we, we, we just touched on that a little bit there. there's, so there's copperheadism there. So let's go back now. Um, the mayor has come out. He's surrendered the town, but he's in Abbottstown. He's gone out to meet Gordon. Uh, Abbottstown's what, about 10 miles from York? Well, actually, the mayor rides out to Farmers, which is 10 oh, okay. miles west. Gordon had rode to Abbottstown. He came back, got the mayor, and they rode back, but Gordon had moved farther east uh, from Abbottstown. He was now in York County at a little village called Farmers. 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 Which is near Thomasville and the York Airport, okay. for those folks who are aware. Uh, no, it's a little bit west of that area. Right, okay. Um, so they go back, and this, so the next day then, uh, Gordon's going to march into town. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the uh, American flag. Oh, yeah, that's a great story. Uh, it's, on Saturday night, to go back to that, uh, there's a debate in downtown York about what to do with the town's flag. They have an 18-foot by 35-foot flag. Bigger than anything. That's enormous. Bigger, bigger than anything Perkins has ever found. Uh, so you it's this, bigger than a car dealership yeah, flag. Yeah, I mean this is massive and it's handmade. Uh, so this and it's flying from the top of an eighty-foot high flagpole. It doesn't sound tall York, enough. Yeah, it, it should. It feels like it should be like two hundred and fifty yeah, feet be. tall. It should be. Maybe that's the straightest tree they could find was only eighty. Eighty feet. feet yeah. But bottom line is, on Saturday night they're debating what are we going to do about this flag. Sure. Uh, and. Uh, the city decides, even though they, you know, have voted Democrat, there's enough union sentiment in town. They decide let's leave the flag flying to show the Confederates we're a loyal town. Right. So they leave it up overnight, uh, or put it up in the morning, Sunday morning. Accounts kind of vary, but it's flying when Gordon's men start approaching town. Now, as Gordon comes into town, by the way, just to kind of show a little bit of the Copperhead element, uh, he's greeted with with ladies and gentlemen waving flags, you know, Confederate flags, uh, as the rebels arrive in the town. A lot of people are waving handkerchiefs. I mean, yeah. there are people that are darning socks for the Confederates. Over yeah, by. yeah. one lady gives that kid yeah, socks, and, he, socks and some kind words. And kind words yeah. for a Confederate that comes in. Yeah. I mean, it's just kind of an amazing story. Strange. Of greeting a, you know, an enemy, enemy you know, army that comes into your town. But as Gordon's men are coming into the town square, they spot this giant flag, of course, flying from this uh, flagpole at the intersection of what's now Market Street and George Streets in, in York City Square. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a ton of accounts as to what actually happened to that flag. Uh, suffice to say, we know one thing. The Confederates hauled the thing down. Some accounts say that Gordon put it in the saddlebags uh, and kept it. Uh, other accounts Those are say big saddlebags. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> um, some suggest that it was uh, torn up uh, by Colonel Avery's North Carolina Brigade and was later used for bandages uh, after the Battle of Gettysburg. Makes sense. Uh, other accounts say that Gordon tied it to his horse's tail and dragged it uh, behind his horse throughout the streets of Gettysburg. I mean, nobody's 100% sure whatever happened to that flag other than the fact it disappeared after the Confederates left and the good citizens of York had to uh, craft their new Make flag. Make a new one. Yeah, put it now, back up. Now, you say they come in on uh, Market Street. 
Uh, now, I've only been to West York once. Mm-hmm. You know, I was on a date, and I don't remember where mm-hmm. I was. And it was a good dinner, though. But um, that's the only time I've ever been out there. So I'm not really familiar with the terrain. So I'm looking on Google Maps now of what York looks like right. today. Um, where did the city limits go sure. in 1863? Yeah, I mean, 1863, the city limits were just west of what is called Cadoris Creek. Uh, so there'd be something called West Avenue. It's near the near today's fairgrounds, uh, just okay. on the side of that. Uh, right. So most of where York's fairgrounds is, which is probably what York's today most known for, as well as the Harley Davidson factory. Mm. Uh, but you know, as they come in, it's all rural farm country pretty much until they get towards the creek, where the town actually starts. Okay. So then, uh, oh, and there's Farquhar Park. Yeah, that's actually oh, that's the same guy we're talking about. He donated land after the uh, oh, Civil War. So they forgave him for selling out the city. Kind of. <laughs> there's still people that want to change the name of the park. By the way. Really? Yeah. Even though, well, believe we it or not, well. believe it or not, I mean, not to denigrate the guy, but. Arthur Briggs Farker is not a Democrat. He's a Republican and a strong supporter of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and yet the Democratic <laughs> mayor seems to get off scot-free, and Farker's the one that takes all the blame for the surrender because he's the one that went out on his own. And when, yeah. But he was a Lincoln supporter. In fact, one of the few Lincoln supporters of note in York. But that's interesting. So now, from what I was reading in your book, uh, there were some people that did blame the mayor though? Absolutely. There were, I mean, the there Repu- was there were the few Republicans in town blamed the mayor. Okay. The many Democrats in town blamed Farker. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's so so partisan. Not, nothing has changed. No, basically. it's highly partisan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was a, an account from a, a Connecticut soldier, I believe, who read it in the papers while with the army. Yeah. And he was kind of disheartened by it. Oh, yeah. I mean, the reaction to a lot of people to the fact that, you know, York was, in fact, it continued for decades after the Civil War. You would periodically uh, find veterans that would, in their writings, would even talk about, quote unquote, the cowardly actions of the mayor of York mm-hmm. uh, or, you know, other such uh, accounts. In fact, the Harrisburg Republican newspapers just pilloried York's leadership for this. Now, Farker himself, <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Farker himself was. Uh, haunted by his actions wasn't really sure he did the right thing so he actually takes his carriage oh well his carriage gets ripped up the battle of gettysburg he buys a new one so he takes his new carriage uh ends up going to the train station uh some um in the months after the battle of gettysburg goes down to washington dc and walks into the executive mansion uh, knocks on lincoln's door and asked to see the president. Yeah, uh, which you could do back then. And, yeah, and the president knew who he was because the president uh, grabs Farker by the arm, takes him into the offices of Secretary of War Edwin Stanton and says, Stanton, see, I've captured the man who surrendered York, <laughs> Pennsylvania. Ah. Uh, what should I do with him? <laughs> and so Stanton, who apparently also knows of this guy, says, yeah, you know, with that kind of courage, we need to make him a colonel. <laughs> <laughs> and so Farker, at least in the president's eyes and the War Department's eyes, did the right thing. But oh. to this day, to this day, if you want to start a controversy in York County, Pennsylvania, talk about the surrender of York. Really? Oh, yeah. There are, there are still some people that have very strong beliefs one way or the other about this. So yeah. it's like the people down in uh, Georgia who are still angry about oh, Sherman's yeah. march. Oh, yeah. And and similarly, there are still uh, farm families in rural York County who still live on the farms. Their great-great-grandpa did. And they still blame Jib Orley and Jeb Stewart for ruining their economic lives for generations. Really? By stealing their horses and taking all their they cows. They still haven't gotten over that. No, just like the guys in Georgia haven't gotten over you know, Uncle Billy Sherman. <laughs> yeah. Same idea, only at a very small scale. Yeah. It's yeah, that's I, I love how it, it's always everybody else's fault. Of course. You know, of generations course. ago it's still their fault. Yeah, I like that. Nothing's changed. No, <laughs> no, exactly. Nothing has changed. Yeah. Um, so speaking of horses and things like that, uh, there were a few stories in there about, uh, people, uh, Confederate stealing, uh, what was it? An 18 year old, uh, kid, um, oh, his, Smizer. his riding horse, yeah. um, after the, after I guess Gordon was, uh, a, at, stayed at their house the night or something? Is that well, what it was? During the afternoon, yeah. Gordon, Gordon, after leaving York on Sunday afternoon, June 28th, marched east to go to Wrightsville. Uh-huh. Uh, again, his original orders were to burn the bridge, but Jube Worley had then re-instructed him to capture the bridge, 
march into Lancaster County, mount a thousand guys on on horses as far as he could steal from there, and then ride on Harrisburg and take it from the rear. So as they're marching east, the men are collecting all the horses they can, including uh, that of this young Smizer, uh, Dan- okay. Daniel Smizer, I think his name was. Uh, but young or young Smizer can't stand the fact the confederates took his prized horse so because his mother just made him promise that they wouldn't harm his property exactly yeah exactly. or their property so the mom and him together you know go complain to gordon and gordon he gets his horse back yeah 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 but the mom loses the rest of the horses so. though Oh, does she? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. So he gets the prize gets riding the- horse, but all the plow horses go. Exactly. Well, you need him for the cannon. Exactly. Um, so now, so that's later on. But even earlier, as they're heading towards York, there's little stories similar to that. There's yeah. some guards. people. What I thought was interesting was he's staying at, the, I think, the Abbott house. And is that the one whose dining room had the spring in it? Uh, he's staying, yeah, he's staying at, actually, it, it's a farm called the the it's not the Altland oh, House. yeah it's not yeah. the Altland house restaurant we think of right. this is the jacob Altland's farmhouse is in farmers pennsylvania uh so it's where gordon camps for the night uh and he talks in his memoirs about this german farmer and his wife that have a spring in the basement of their home with crocks of very cold uh ice cold milk yeah and how much he enjoys that well that farmhouse still exists and a good friend of mine's been in the cellar a couple times uh, and has reported the spring's still there. Oh, that's cool. Uh, but yeah, so it's the cellar, not the dining room. Correct. Okay, because that wasn't... Yeah. Again, uh, it's not the Altland house. It's a private farmhouse. Correct. House. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but it was... The name is Altland, but it's correct. not the Altland yes. house that we know of correct. in Abbottstown. Correct. This right. is in York County. York, in uh, Farmers. It's, it's not in a town. It's out in the county. Yeah, yeah. it's in Farmers. Um, but, he, but Gordon says that he... Uh, he was surprised at how relaxing it was. Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. it's like a spa in yeah. his mind. I mean, he's been hot. He's been dusty. You sure. know, he's been on the road since leaving you know, Virginia back in early June. I mean, they've been on the march since June 4th, in his case. Uh, and here he is, the most relaxing thing you can find. You know, fresh milk, cool, bubbling water. Yeah. The shade of a, of a cool uh, stone cellar. Who wouldn't, I mean, he's who wouldn't like that after yeah, all that stuff? He's in yeah, he's And now you mentioned the dust. These guys, when they come into York... Uh, they're covered in dust and the people are rather appalled uh, oh, at yeah. the way they look. Um, and, uh, but they but the people of York turn out now, first of all, so they come in on, what did you say? Like Market on, Street? They come in on three parallel roads. Oh, that's where streets. I was going. So yeah. they come in on three parallel roads. Right. So go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. I mean, they, they actually, uh, on the western outskirts of York, uh, they will t- split the column up into three sections. Some will continue east on Market Street, uh, the main street of town, which, of course, is old U.S. Route 30, Lincoln Highway, if you will, mm-hmm. for post-Civil War uh, highway aficionados. Uh, but they're going to come in on these three parallel roads uh, and heading into downtown York. And again, people are waving handkerchiefs. Some people wanting buttons from the Confederate officers, yeah. <laughs> coats. There are other people that are just kind of admiring the Confederates coming in. But the Confederates are doing their own little shenanigans. Like in some cases, they're lifting the hats off of the bystanders. Keep in Taking mind, that kid's hat, is, yeah. yeah, this is Sunday morning, yeah. and a lot of the York people are dressed in their church clothes, and they've got on their you know, their fine top hats and their, their best clothing. And so the you know, mischievous young 18, 20, 22-year-old Confederates, you know, Just, have a good time of it, <laughs> taking the, you know, these fancy hats off the heads of these civilians. Yeah. Uh, the uh, uh, What was the woman's name? Um, mm, mm, mm. it's escaping me right now. Let me see if I can. You quote her a lot in the beginning. Um, Cassandra Small. That's it. Yeah. Um, she she's writing to someone to a her woman, cousin. her cousin, yes. Yeah. And uh, she she doesn't seem to uh, hold back on any of her opinions of. Oh no, <laughs> no. I mean, think uh, she her dad, uh, Philip Albright Small, is York's leading miller. Uh, there. Yeah, very, very popular miller, uh, quite wealthy, uh, owns a building that is now uh, opposite the Yorktown Hotel. Uh, that was their home. Well, they are Republicans, and they ha- don't have a lot of kind things to say at all about the Copperheads. And so in her series of three letters to her cousin, there are some of the best civilian accounts 
you'll read in, in York about the invasion. She talks about a line's been drawn for generations uh, that the you know the women that supported the Confederates will never be able to show themselves in society. Fine, fine society yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So I want to get into that a little bit uh, after all of this. What happens? I mean, there is a line drawn. She mm -hmm. says it right there. So at least in her mind, there's going to be a line. Are other people uh, following suit with her? Yeah, there are. There are yeah. actually other letters. I mean, Cassandra Small's letters are the most famous, but there are many other letters from New York residents, many of which have uncovered since the book came out. No. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you'll find that the Copperheads are very upset with the uh, the folks who were, you know, for, their their view was these pro unionists threatened their very town that if they angered the Confederates, they were going to burn the town to the ground. Mm. So they were very upset with the Smalls and the Latimers and the Farkers and the other. So they support the Confederates, and uh, clearly they must think that they're right or the better people. Or they don't want their houses burned but, down. But, so. but, well, right. And then yeah. I'm going to say, and then, but your behavior will make them be bad. Yeah, but you're the bad guy, not them, oh, for yeah. ultimately deciding to burn our house. Yeah, and that's really which is very much like the way people are now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And that's the divide that happens. And and to Miss Small's prediction, yeah, I mean it does last at least a generation or two where there is still this definite dividing line in York, and even to this very day, really, there's still vestiges of the Civil War. I mean, there are people who are ashamed that York has surrendered. There are people that are angry that York surrendered, and there are people who think it was the right call because the rebels surely would have burned the town to the ground. Because again, in 1864, Jubilee Worley does burn Chambersburg. But yeah. it's 63. It's and a New different, York, yeah. It's a different time. And they war. hadn't burned Gettysburg. No, they didn't burn Gettysburg. I mean, they were burning... The reason I call my book Flames Beyond Gettysburg is they do burn military warehouses, sure. civilian buildings that are used to house military supplies, uh -huh. railroad, bridges, things of that nature. Which And they did destroy that Thaddy, stuff here. And Thaddy, yeah. yeah, and Thaddy, oh, Thaddy Stevens', Stevens yeah, place. Yeah. yeah, out of Caledonia. Yeah. yeah, but they weren't just going and burning everything. No, they weren't that. burning civilians' houses to the ground, not in 1863 at least. But the York citizens didn't know that. Right. Well, exactly. So you got to think of what they knew at the time. Right. And, yeah. And, and, that's and there were plenty of Confederates that would uh, say, you know, you sure you don't have more food? You sure you don't have another horse out in the woods? You know, if I. Yeah, and so there's a lot of veiled hints that circulate throughout York that the Confederates are certainly going to burn your property down. Uh -huh. uh, okay. And there's a great quote by one of Jeb Stewart's cavalrymen, 18-year-old uh, uh, guy by the name of Louis Wigfall, whose dad's a senator from the state of Confederate senator from the state of Texas. And he says, you know, it wouldn't have surprised the old Dutch in Pennsylvania if we'd have concluded the business by burning all their buildings to the ground and massacring all the women and children. <laughs> So that's the prevailing fear that the Confederates, at least some of them, are certainly stoking. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It seems to me that uh, the North, you know, they were good at industry and logistics and all that stuff. And also just, you know, brutalizing a, a, a territory that they occupied. The South was good. They were wily. Like they were tricky. You know, like they, there's a lot more stories of them, like just saying things like playing on the fears and the ignorance of oh, the yeah. people to get their way without actually having sure. to do anything. Oh, yeah. They don't, they didn't, they don't bully them through force. It's just the threat of force uh -huh. playing on that. Exactly. Yeah. It uh, makes for more humorous stories. Um, OK, so uh, while Gordon is in York. Uh, what goes on? Is it pretty uneventful, or is well, there... Gordon's only in York on for a brief period on Sunday, June twenty eighth. His mm -hmm. mission is to go to Wrightsville, and of course, eventually he's going to uh, encounter the Pennsylvania State Militia. So they're just passing through. Gordon is passing Gordon through, is. but Jib Early is coming with the rest of the division. So Early will bring in Isaac Avery's North Carolina Brigade and William Extra Billy Smith's Virginia Brigade. And uh, Harry Hayes, Louisiana Tigers. Uh -huh. So Early will actually occupy York with three brigades while Gordon goes to the river. So we've got about 5,000 Confederates that will spend June 28th, 29th, and the morning of the 30th uh, in York before they depart. 
what is the difference between when Gordon is there alone with his brigade and when Early arrives with everybody else? Is there a is there a difference? I should say. Well, there's between... a big difference because Gordon again is just passing through. Right. I mean, his job's not to occupy York. His job's to get to right. And he set up guards along the road to he make does. sure that the troops stay in line and they don't destroy anything. Right. He's given his word, all that jazz. Correct. Because his job is is to keep moving. Right. So he doesn't want to be impeded. He also he really doesn't want his men breaking ranks and you know trying to find alcohol getting in trouble, or getting in trouble <laughs> yeah. you know stopping for yeah. food or socks or whatever the, the natives are, are giving him sure joe borley is quite the opposite early actually comes into town from the north where gordon comes in from the west because uh, gordon's on today's u.s route 30 slash route 462 slash mm-hmm. lincoln highway yeah uh early comes down from the north so he, he will arrive uh about noon uh, where Gordon has passed through at 10 o'clock in the morning just as church bells are ringing. Uh, and Early immediately occupies the town. He puts men uh, in the town square. He puts men in the U.S. Army camp. He puts men in the U.S. Army hospital. He, pu- he plants uh, <laughs> cannons on three sides of York on the hills surrounding the town. So, uh, I mean, Jubal really makes it very, very clear. And on Sunday afternoon, June 28th, he makes one of the most audacious claims of his career. Uh, He asks York for $100,000 in cash, three days worth of supplies, uh, including massive amounts of supplies, including 1,000 pairs of shoes, which he does get, by the way. The the shoes are in York, not in Gettysburg. Oh, okay, there you go. Uh, So he does get all his 1,000 pairs of shoes. He wants some boots. Uh, But he wants $100,000. And so York City Council goes door to door uh, and they collect $28,610 in cash that they turn over to Jim Worley on that Sunday afternoon that he first occupies the town. And then Early starts negotiating. I want the rest of my money. <laughs> and now they start really worrying about is he going to burn the town down. Uh, so one of York's businessmen, Cassandra Small's father, in fact, uh, P.A. Small, will give him a $50,000 bond uh, based on his personal fortune that, you know, okay, mm. just don't burn our town down uh and then early wants to destroy the railroad shops and wants to burn them to the ground but cooler heads prevail that you know the winds are going to blow this stuff and burn our town down so please don't burn the railroad station down which early decides not to do that was nice of him (laughs) here here's the list uh that you have in the book Uh, 165 barrels of flour or 28,000 pounds of baked bread right 3,500 pounds of sugar, 1,650 pounds of coffee, 300 gallons of molasses, 1,200 pounds of salt, 32,000 pounds of fresh beef, or 21,000 pounds of bacon or pork. All were to be delivered at the Market House on Main Street at 4 p.m. Early's Chief Quartermaster, Major C.E. Snodgrass, demanded 2,000 pairs of shoes or boots, 1,000 pair of socks, 1,000 felt hats and $100,000 in greenbacks. Yeah, and he gets 1,000 shoes. I mean, that's a little bad. more than 1,000. Yeah, and he gets most of the other supplies, uh, including all the beef that he wants. Well, I mean, I guess if it's that or have your life and, you know, your home and your business yeah. and everything burned to the ground, yeah. you do it. Yeah, I mean, it's the largest ransom that Early's going to collect during the Gettysburg campaign. Obviously, in 64, uh, they're going to put more audacious or audacious claims onto the civilians. In fact, uh, Chambersburg is going to be, they're going to ask for $500,000 in cash and 100000 in gold from little tiny Chambersburg yeah. in 1864, which is outrageous. I don't think outrageous. you can come up with that now. No, I, I'm sure you couldn't, <laughs> uh, especially the gold. But in 1863, right. the, you know, the people of York are just kind of stunned by the whole affair. Uh, and again, there's the other controversy. A lot of people donate to the Confederate cause, including some of York's Republicans who will later write in their diaries, why did they do this? Mm. Uh, oh, they, so they regretted oh, doing yeah, it. Oh, yeah, they very much regret it, yeah. I get, but yeah, but I guess, again, we're, we're not in that situation. Uh, it's been a while since I've lived in a town that was invaded by an enemy yeah, force. Just a little, yeah, <laughs> so, not often. So we don't know really how we would react to that, regardless right. of our political affiliation. Exactly. You know, you're terrified, and a guy's saying, give me this or I'll kill you. What are you going to do? Oh, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. I don't think you're a political affiliation. I mean, you have to be really, really brave and committed to your cause oh, yeah. to stand there and say to the guy, kill me oh yeah you know which leads to one of the most amazing stories in the book the one that i frank frankly get a lot of questions about and that's the bravery of one civilian in wrightsville um on sunday night june 28th 
Gordon will march to Wrightsville, again trying to capture the bridge, but the Pennsylvania State Militia will retreat across it. They will have uh, some of the civilians uh, from the bank that owns the bridge. They'll actually burn the thing to the ground. This, you know, mile and a quarter long wooden covered bridge. With a wind shift, Wrightsville catches on fire, and Gordon will actually order his Georgia infantry to fan out, form bucket brigades, and pass water buckets from the canal and the river back uphill into downtown Wrightsville. Well, the daughter of the Chief Burgess of Wrightsville uh, comes and finds John Gordon on Sunday night as, you know, the town's smoky and you know, flames are still burning on the river, and she wants to thank Gordon. So she invites him to come to her house on Monday morning for breakfast. Mm -hmm. you imagine put your point on an enemy enemy force, in, force invading your town, and now you're going to invite the enemy right. general to your house for breakfast. For breakfast. Well, this lady, uh, you know, Gordon, on Monday morning, June 29th, does show up at her house. She does feed him breakfast. He thinks she's a Confederate sympathizer because he's run into all of these sympathizers. Uh. And, he st and he also thinks she's a spy because when he's in downtown York, a little girl hands him a bouquet of red roses, roses with the complete plans of Wrightsville's defenses. Mm. And it's what it, Gordon and Gordon, this document's written in a woman's flowery handwriting. Right. Now he's thought he's found a spy in Wrightsville. It's got to be this woman. Well, she ends up mouthing off to this Confederate general, <laughs> you know, and basically because he's kind of uh, probing to see if she is the spy and she turns out and she says well with my assent in my direction she's a newlywed my husband's in the union army and i hope that our cause mr lincoln's cause prevails you know and gordon's like kind of taken aback by the <laughs> brashness of this woman you know who to your point, he's very brash and very bold yeah. in the presence of an enemy officer uh, who's just saved her town from burning to the ground. Uh, what well, Gordon then calls her the heroine of the Susquehanna and says that other than his sainted mother and his beloved wife, this is the bravest woman he's ever met in his <laughs> life. You know, and it's this little, you know, newlywed you know, lass, if you will, yeah. uh, in sitting in Wrightsville, Pennsylvania. Well, the youth are always full of piss and vinegar. Yeah, so. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's a great, great comment. But you mentioned spies. Yeah. And you, you go into um, into into that. There's some thoughts of some spies. So Bible salesmen. Uh, yeah, that's a great story. Uh, and it's one that I, when I first, I'll tell the story, but I first thought it, it didn't happen until I later found documentation. But throughout York County, there's a one-armed Bible salesman and two young men that are accompanying him. Sounds like a setup for a joke. No, it's not. <laughs> well, it's yeah, a one-armed Bible salesman. Well, the joke's, the joke's on the people of York. Yeah. Uh, but this guy hires, uh, if you will, taxis back in those days, public carriages, uh, hires farmers to take them throughout uh, York County. Uh, and his job is to scout out the roads that uh, Early's division is later going to take during the planned invasion of Pennsylvania. All this is going on uh, in March or so time frame, March, April time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, but he tells the civilians that I'm here to sell Bibles. And I want to know who's the richest farmers in the region that might want to buy Bibles. There's a U.S. <laughs> Army camp in York. Who's the commander? Uh, there's a Army hospital, 1,600 beds. Do they have a defensive force that's guarding the hospital <laughs> patients? Do they have money? Do they want Bibles? Uh, and he goes all over the county and tells people that that's his, his cover story. And then he tells them, when I come back in the summer with my friends, I'll bring your Bibles. Well, that part's true. And I was able to document all that from some independent accounts that I found of people who actually hired these Confederates. And this so, was when before? How long before? April, um, April. April, March, April, early May time frame. It's well before the invasion. Interesting. So, so it's before Chancellorsville even. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This okay. time's before Chancellorsville. Okay. Okay. So, so Leah, you know, has obviously been planning to come to Pennsylvania a long time because in February, Stonewall Jackson had told his map maker to make him Jedediah Hotchkiss to make him a map that went up to the Susquehanna right, Valley. Right, yeah. 
But the, the kicker to the story, and this is the part that I've never been able to prove, but it's legend in York County, is that when Jew Worley arrives on Sunday, June 28th, one of his wagons contains this one-armed Bible salesman in a Confederate major's uniform who tosses a box of Bibles out on York Square and tells the citizens, see, I told you I'd bring my uh. Bibles when I brought my friends. Meet my friend, Jew Worley. Wow. So that part I've never been able to prove. I'd love to be able to prove that's that great, part of the that's story. That's a great ending to that oh, story. Oh, yeah, it is. But the rest of the story we know for sure is true. I mean, there were spies operational uh, throughout York uh, that were working in conjunction to verify Hotchkiss' map. Yeah, and it's not just him. There's other oh, ones. Oh, there are plenty yeah. of others. Yeah, plenty yeah. of others. There are several spies that actually get arrested in Wrightsville that are scouting out the bridge. Okay. Um, uh, oh, uh, Extra Billy Smith, is he the one who says, my friends, how do you like this way of oh, our yeah. coming back into the Union? Yeah, William Extra Billy Smith is a, the oldest general at the Battle of Gettysburg in either army. Mm -hmm. uh, he's 60, 63, I think, here at Gettysburg. Uh, no, sorry, 66. He's born in 1797. Uh, but Smith uh, comes into York uh, and stops his brigade of Virginians north of York and makes this rattling speech about, you know, well, you wanted us to come back in the Union, and here we are. How do you like the way we've come back into the Union? We're right. here. Uh, and it's, you know, again, going to the fact of how mixed the politics were in, the, in York. According to Major Robert Stiles, who's an artilleryman with Extra Billy Smith's column, the citizens of York hooted and hollered and applauded mm. a Confederate general making a speech of an invading army on the streets of their town. And they're applauding him because this guy is such a polished speaker. He's so funny and charismatic that he's got the townspeople in stitches, even though they have no clue what he's going to do to their town. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and does Jubal Early come up and yell at him? Yeah, he does. In fact, Jubal Early and, and Extra Billy, and I talk about this in my uh, biography of Extra Billy Smith, uh, but Early and Smith are not friends. They're political enemies. Uh, Jubal Early's been a Whig uh, most of his life. Uh, Extra Billy Smith is a five-term U.S. congressman in the Democratic Party, former governor of Virginia during the Mexican War, and now governor-elect of Virginia during the Gettysburg campaign. Mm -hmm. Devout Democrat. Uh, and Joe Borley can't stand him. Uh, uh, Smith has, has had a badly injured shoulder at the Battle of Antietam in September of 62. Uh, and so as he's creating this traffic jam while he's making this giant speech in York on North George Street, uh, Jubal Worley comes up behind him on horseback and grabs him by the injured shoulder mm. and kind of jerks him around and says, you know, in effect, what in the fool are you doing <laughs> halting this column in this cursed town? You know, get a move on it, in effect. Uh, but he very deliberately grabs the injured shoulder. Yeah. Yeah. Early doesn't sound like a very nice guy. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, okay. So then let's get on to the bridge in yeah. Wrightsville. Uh, what's the story there? How does that all go down? Yeah, the, the bridge in Wrightsville, as I mentioned earlier, was the longest bridge, in, covered bridge in the world at the time. Uh, it was the only bridge, again, between Harrisburg and uh, Conowingo, Maryland. So Gordon's job is to go take the bridge. Uh, as he comes out on Sunday afternoon, June 28th, after leaving uh, York, he encounters about 1,500 Pennsylvania state militiamen. Uh, they're accompanied by 50 or so black uh, civilians in civilian clothing uh, carrying army guns. There are the ambulatory patients from the U.S. Army Hospital in York. There are some soldiers that have walked back to York after being defeated at the Second Battle of Winchester mm -hmm. on June 15th, 1863. They just walked home uh, after that battle to, to Gettysburg and to, to York. So this motley force of defenders that are, you know, some a lot of militiamen, most of whom have never fought before. Uh, and tucked in the middle of this are some Union veterans, and they're including a colonel who is a uh, double citation for Medal of Honor recipient named uh, Jacob Frick, a colonel coal miner from Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Well, these guys put up a pretty decent fight uh, against Gordon. They're going to delay Gordon long enough that almost all of the Pennsylvania militia can escape across the bridge. And then, as I mentioned, they burn the bridge uh, to make sure that Gordon cannot cross into Lancaster County. And our dear friend Jill Borley rides on his horse from York west to find out, well, you know, I haven't got a courier from Gordon saying you've taken the bridge. And then he sees this 
ugly wisp of smoke on the horizon, and he realizes, you know, the pit of his stomach, this isn't right. Right, right. Uh, yeah, Gordon, you were supposed to burn the bridge, but I told you not to burn the bridge. Why is the bur bridge burning? <laughs> and he gets closer, he realizes that the bridge is indeed on fire, and he's not getting into Lancaster County, and he rides up to Gordon near the riverbank and generally berates him starting a feud between gordon and early that's going to last oh. most of the rest of their lives okay uh and just john jordan doesn't appreciate his commanding officer leaping all over him uh but suffice to say early is disappointed he's really upset with gordon he rides back to york uh, eats his dinner and goes to bed uh, and the next morning receives orders to leave as uh, lee is concentrating his army at heidlersburg and cash down so the bridge uh, is burning, and then doesn't Gordon get blamed for burning yes. Wrightsville? Yeah, Gordon's going to take a lot of blame from a lot of the residents, because part of Wrightsville catches on fire. From the fire from of the, the bridge. From the fire of the bridge, because the wind shifts, and there's now a nor'easter blowing in with strong <laughs> winds blowing Perfect east timing. to west. Yeah, and, and so the, they blow it back into Wrightsville, and so the post office burns to the ground, a millinery shop, several apartment buildings, most of the lumber yards along the river burn to the ground, and that's when Gordon forms this bucket brigade to try to save the rest of the town. But Gordon, for all of, you know, in, in his mind at least, well, he should be a hero because he saved the town. Yeah. But in a lot of Wrightsville civilians' uh, mind, if you didn't show up, our town would have never been, our bridge wouldn't have been burned, our post office wouldn't have been okay. burned. You're to blame, General Gordon. So even though he helped, he doesn't get the credit. Care. Yeah, a lot of people don't care. It's amazing how, how the human mind works oh, I know. sometimes. I know. You know, like. <laughs> and it's amazing to me as you read these stories in the Civil War. How we are the same. Yeah. You know, We've you know, never changed. Five generations later, whatever it may have been, 160 years, the we're the same. And it's a lot of the same arguments, too. Oh, yeah. Like Very nothing so. was really settled. I know. It's it's weird. It's it's sad, actually. Now, I'm looking at uh, a Google satellite image of uh, Wrightsville, and the pylons from the original bridge are still there. Uh -huh. And now, obviously, 462, uh, which is also the Lincoln Highway, goes parallel to it. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty wide. How long was that? Yeah, it was a mile and a quarter wide, so it was about Jeez. five thousand six hundred and some odd feet across. Wow! Uh, and again, this was built. In eight, the bridge was built in eighteen twelve. It was knocked down by ice in eighteen thirty two. Was rebuilt on the pylons that uh, that are still there today, uh, and again was burned uh, in eighteen sixty three. It was rebuilt again as a covered bridge. Was knocked down in eighteen ninety seven by a very massive windstorm or tornado, if you will, uh, that the whole destroyed, thing? destroyed the entire bridge. Just, wow. I mean, just knocked the whole thing into the river. So it was rebuilt again, this time as a steel truss bridge. And in 1962, the wrecking balls finally took it down. So Okay, so those pylons... Would those be the? Those are the original locations. The original locations of the Civil War pylons, but they've been strengthened and modified and rebuilt over the years. So particularly when we the, put the steel bridge on. So okay, it, it's it's the same pylons, but, but they've it's been, not. But but not. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's where they were, but it's not them. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, they're there. They're just encased in other the strong, stuff. Yeah, right. The stronger yeah. ones that were built. You can, in other words, you can't see them unless the things that it's encased in have been knocked away yeah, or something. Yeah. 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 But still, it's cool to, to go and see. Oh, it um, is. So for, for our viewers, the next time you take the Route 30 bridge, modern Route 30 bridge over uh, the Susquehanna River between Lancaster and York County, if you look to the south, uh, you will see, the, again, these pylons sitting next to the 1920-ish bridge uh, that is now the uh, replacement toll bridge. What's that bridge up on? Uh, I think it's 81, and there's there's pylons in the river going across up by Harrisburg. Do you know yeah. what I'm talking about? Yeah, those was the uh, there were two bridge two railroad bridges right there. One was at uh, St. Mary's uh, or Marysville, and the other one was at, at uh, Rockville. Uh, and those were bridges for the Northern Central Railway and for the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad. <laughs> so again, our viewers might be familiar. If you're going up uh, up that area, you can often see there's a, a Statue of Liberty uh, on one of the old pylons sitting in the middle of the oh, yeah. Susquehanna River. Yeah, and it's not. I'm not. It's it wasn't 81. I think it was, no, uh, it was 83 80, that I'm thinking. Yeah, of. it's 83 yeah. and, uh, and uh, 322. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, all right. So the name of the book is uh, Flames Beyond Gettysburg, the Confederate Expedition to the Susquehanna River, June 1863 by Scott Mingus. Um, you, you, we'll have you on again, Scott, because oh, you have other books. I've written a lot of books. Yeah, so, so we'll have you on and we'll talk about each one of the books. Sounds good. I appreciate um, it. I'll put a link to the book in the description of the show so you can go to Amazon and uh, and buy it there. Um, and uh, that's about it. I know you're kind of pressed for time today, so oh, I don't no want to take too much of your I time. It. We'll have you on for a longer time on the, the next uh, appearance. Sounds but good. Thank you for coming on, Scott. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Stay thank you. well. Thank you. All right. And thank you all for listening. All right, guys. Outstanding. Thanks.